We'll start with uh, an introduction to masonry arch assessment from Stuart Morrison. Stuart is an account manager with Lucas, has some 30 years of experience in finite element methods, and um, I pass over to you, Stuart. Okay, uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, my talk's about introducing masonry arch uh, to you all. Uh, the, uh, the concept has been around uh, for many years. Sort of masonry arches have been used probably for about 4,000 years. Uh, they are still forming uh, a large part of our highway and railway system here in the UK. And uh, an estimate by my colleague who wrote the spear was there are about 60,000 of them in use in the UK. Uh, I don't know if you've counted them all personally, Steve, but um, yes, he has. He's seen every one of them in detail. <laughs> and, and some of these are sort of can be over a thousand years old, and I think they're quite pleasing, and I think we should try and keep as many as possible. So what we're going to talk about today is how you actually assess them, because pulling them down, as we've been experiencing from this talk, is, can be very expensive, and we'd like to keep as many as possible. There are sort of two sort of main methods. There's what we refer to as the simple methods, uh, which include the mechanism and the, the MEXI method, and really the advanced methods. And through the advanced methods, you can understand more about the material behavior, how the soil interacts with the structure itself, and you can also look more detail about ring separation, a lot more features in the actual structure as it goes forward. Typically, the simple methods tend to be over-conservative, as shown by the fact that these bridges have been around for many, many years, and today we progressively drive bigger and bigger vehicles over them. So, over-design, simple methods, but you get a, an idea that things are able to work. However, the advanced methods are now available to us, especially through techniques such as finite element methods, uh, which is surprisingly how little take-up there is using FE for this type of application. It's quite ideal, really, to use a finite element program to address these types of problems. But is it the thought that they tend to be non-linear in nature, and the amount of extra data you have to pull together, is that putting people off? But hopefully, uh, by using these advanced methods, you'll get a better understanding of the structure, uh, how it can potentially uh, unlock more reserves of strength if you use these advanced methods. A lot of what I'm talking about today uh, in this presentation for both the simple and advanced methods can be found in the TRL State of the Art Review on Masonry Arch Bridges and the Syria Guide Masonry Arch Bridges and Condition and Appraisal, which I can say are riveting readings and I think you should all get copies and read them because they send you to sleep very easily. But uh, challenges in life is put before us, so have a read of these and away we go. On the simple methods, the um, mechanism method is routinely used for many arch bridges. It's basically observed that a failure with formation of hinges, typically uh, four hinges will form, one on the internal face, one on the external face, and at the hinge points themselves. Typically this is just a simple equilibrium calculation that leads to a value of failure, which is balanced by the self-weight of the arch itself. Typically, you repeat this exercise over and over again until you find a minimum load, and that's your basically uh, your uh, strength of the structure. And there are programs around which proceed with this sort of technique. This has been sort of enhanced. Uh, those assumptions were attributed to Pippard around about the 1950s, but still, we still think of. Um, these materials in these sort of approaches can't carry any tension, has infinite, uh, infinite strength in compression, is completely rigid, there can be no sliding between the individual blocks themselves, and there's no structural contribution from the fill. But having said all that, it basically is used as a upper bound unsafe method, uh, but it is used extensively in the marketplace. Taking that a little further, you could look at uh, a plastic hinge analysis using FE. This would make it possible to consider misshapen arches and include backfield as, say, a load spring approach. This isn't a method we'd recommend actually for representing soil spring interaction, uh, soil structure interaction, but it certainly takes it one step further. Uh, any talk on masonry assessment, you cannot really exclude Mexi. 
Mexi comes into all the conversations. It's based upon some tests in the early 20th century. There are codified versions of this out there you can use. And there are some assumptions and factors built in for, say, span to rise, profiles, different materials, joints, and the general condition can be incorporated into a MEXI type approach. It basically assumes an elastic analysis. Uh, the center line is modeled, but typically the effective span isn't equal to the actual span. Uh, tapered barrel thickness is assumed. Also, this approach tends to look at crown loading. Whereas typically we know that uh, quarter point lo wo loading is worse condition for these types of structures, not crown loading. And thrust is typically in the middle half of the structure. That said, it's a widely used process and it's trusted. It works. It has limited accuracy in things such as small spans where the arch depth to fill over the crown is greater than the barrel thickness itself. Mid-shapen arches um, and gothic arches not really included. And things like spandrel walls, wing walls, fills and parapets are generally not included in these types of calculations. But it's probably the most widely used method currently in today in the UK. Moving on to more advanced methods, such as using finite elements, can address a whole range of applications which you can't do with these simple methods, such as looking at cracking and crushing in the barrel, uh, ring separation, any soil structure interaction, and any geometric nonlinearity. These are the things we can address using advanced tools. Typically, an arch is loaded at typically a quarter span, as I said. Cracking occurs under the load and then you get a similar cracking point on the other side and around the support conditions. That's a sort of classical behavior of an arch. And if we put that in finite element terms, we can actually see the same sort of behavior addressing here. Cracking under the load and cracking on the other quarter and also around the support conditions. With this example, we're using a simple pipard approach that um, simple pin supports dead loads are included, then the actual load is just ramped up to give us the result we're seeing on the screen. <coughs> Local failure of this starts around about 12 tonnes, which might be regarded as the lower bound result here. And total global failure, when two full hinges have occurred, is reported back in this example about 38 and a half tonnes, as shown in the graph below. Typical displacements in masonry structures tend to be small, so you're not going to see this, but as this actually develops hinges, you can get quite gross deflections, which hopefully will not happen in reality, but they are possible. In going forward, we are using a concrete material model here. And a word of caution, it's sort of the suitability of using a concrete model for masonry, there's a lot of similarity between the two. There's a lot of similarity of low tensile strength in masonry structures as in concrete and a high compressive strength. But some of the numbers you work with may need some verification due to the way in which the tests are carried out. As we've heard before, for concrete we tend to use a cylindrical test, whereas for a, a masonry structure we tend to use blocks and apply different sorts of tests. But you can uh, normally apply with some confidence the concrete material models that are now available to look at this type of application. Ring separation is another step forward from a basic arch structure. And what you're doing here is introducing either a joint or a delamination planes to represent the planes of failure. And in there you would introduce a tensile strength or a shear, a shear failing strength to actually understand collapse as this moves forward. So here what we're doing, we're taking the same example as before, which had a peak load of about 38.5 tonnes, and introducing some interface elements to represent the rings. And again, we're going to push this to failure. And exactly the same looks and feel, the concrete tends to crack again, and you see the mechanism start to develop. Slightly different failure mode from before, as you can see from the graph, and this time the peak load has reduced to about 28 tonnes compared to 38 tonnes when we didn't look at ring separation, ring failure. Of course, the beauty of finite elements, you're really limited to your imagination what you do with them. 
In this particular example, we're now taking defect into consideration and introducing doweling. We're doweling the structure, we're pulling it together. We're trying to pull those rings back together. So what we've done in this example, introduced a ring of uh, some stainless steel bars of certain diameter and certain spacing. You can see four of them running through the structure. And then we preload those, and then we again, we ramp up the loads. Similar sort of activity, <coughs> failure, mechanisms introducing. But this time, we see a completely different style of failure. It's more brittle. We're getting up to a collapse load of about 28 tonnes, which is getting closer to the, the <coughs> failure we've had before. Oh, sorry, this was 32 tonnes. Uh, whereas the failure before is 38 tonnes. But it's a completely different failure pattern, and this time it's more of a brittle type failure. Of course, we're not limited to 2D. A lot of our structures are 3D. They have skews associated with them. So with the finite element technique, unlike the simple methods, you can put in nice 3D models. And then with 3D models, you can also look at introducing backfills. So on top of the ring arch itself, we're introducing the soils now. And this can be using a, a very typical type soil material model, such as more coulon, to represent the soil. And again, this can be in 2, 3, 2D or 3D. This time, it will distribute the load from the actual road deck through to the structure. And again, you can have ring separation in this, and you can have the dowels in this. And this complexity can grow as much as you like. So this time, if we, with our soil in there, we will push this forward and what was a 12 ton uh, failure in the first soil model we've now pushed this up to about 41 tons which is giving you much more confidence in the structure where it's going and the whole behavior progressively what we're doing here is going step by step one of the things we've been <coughs> stressing throughout the whole session is don't jump in and do this at day one do the simple models first, grow towards this. These are quite complex non-linear models, but when you get the confidence, you can easily get to this stage of complexity in the modeling. They were material nonlinearities. We can also consider geometric nonlinearities. This is when the load paths are dependent upon the changes in the structure. As the structure moves, the load paths may change, such as the, uh, the center line of this arch moves out of the way and it may no longer be in pure bending, it may start to take some axial loads. These can be considered through a non-linear geometric addition to what we've been talking about. On the validation front, there are a lot of papers put out there. This was a recent paper found in the Engineering Services uh, Engineering Structures Journal and Tony was co-author of this. Yes, he says. <laughs> he thinks he remembers. Uh, that's one paper you can gain read and also for general masonry arch bridges this was from the Institute of Civil Engineers Structures and Buildings published in about 1999 <coughs> so in summary to introduce this finite elements can really take your knowledge of these types of structures forward you can introduce concepts of cracking and crushing in the particular material model you can look at ring separation you can include non-linear soils for the fill and how does the soil interact with the structure. You can introduce non-linearities but the beauty of it all you can have complete flexibility over the geometry you're modeling. You can actually model the true structure and get a better handle on how the things actually behaves. Also this can be in 3D and then you go forward and you want to uh, uh, introduce how you repair these structures, introduce dowels and any other methods of introducing strengthening to them, they can all be incorporated into the finite element model. That's really just giving you a bit of an overview. Uh, as Phil said, Philip said, we're going to have a slight change of uh, order here, but Julian will pick this up after the next presentation and introduce some of the concepts and how you actually use them in a program like LUSAS. Thanks, Jeff.